Welcome. My name is Jennifer Baron Prawl. Happy to have you. And you are here today for the webinar is What is Peer Support? This is going to be an excellent, excellent presentation. Um, my name, then again, like I say, is Jennifer Baron Prawl. I am the project manager for the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. And I'm really pleased today to be your host for today's presentation, again, entitled What is Peer Support? New Supervisor Information. And this is going to be facilitated by Gita Enders and Rita Cronice, who are both amazing. We are so very lucky to have them both here with us today. And we truly hope that you find um, today's presentation to be engaging then and helpful in your work. All right. A few things just to start off with. I wanted to just give a quick disclaimer that this particular presentation was prepared for by our MHTTC network. Um, and we work with SAMHSA. And all the opinions that are expressed within the presentation are the views of our speakers and don't reflect the official presentation or position of the Department of um, Health and Human Services. Also, what I really like to point out too is that our whole MHTTC network uses affirming and respectful recovery oriented language in all of our activities. So I always think it's really nice to take a minute to look at the slide. This is what's kind of our foundational then approach when it comes to how we talk during our, our presentations. Language matters. Next, I wanted to just share, this is our South Southwest MHTTC Code of Conduct. We're dedicated to providing events where everyone feels welcome. So we invite everyone here today to help us to achieve a safe, respectful and inclusive, positive environment for learning. So essentially, we ask that, that you be kind, be kind to one another as we continue with today's um, webinar. A few housekeeping items. Um, again, if we have any technical issues that happens during the webinar, know that we'll circle back with you during your registration um, with your registration information. Okay, so we've done everything that we, we can to make this webinar secure. All attendees have the ability to unmute and share your video. Again, we're on a Zoom meeting platform. We really encourage you to use a chat box for any questions or comments. Um, both Mordecai and myself will be managing then the chat box today. So feel free again to um, ask questions and um, let us know if you have any needs or concerns, we'll be watching that. We want to let you know that this session is being recorded. And what we'll do is when the session is over, hopefully within a week, we'll get that then uploaded to our website. So you can watch that again or share that information with other folks. We will be um, providing CEUs for the presentation. I'll be emailing you a CEU certificate within a week of the presentation, if not sooner. So anticipate receiving then a link where you can download your 1.5 um, CEUs. And then lastly, just know that we'll have a brief survey then at the end of today's presentation for you to complete. For folks who are new to the MHTTC network, just wanted to share again that our team is the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, which is located here in this purple section, which is region six. And we are again, really, really honored to be hosting today's event. Our goal and our purpose is to develop and strengthen specialized behavioral health care and primary health care workforce that provides them excellent mental health prevention and treatment for folks. And we really want to then help them folks incorporate um, effective practices within into their mental health services. So feel free after this presentation to visit our website and you can find um, our center as well as then see other centers that where you may be calling in from today um, and learn about their resources. So it'd be wonderful. Okay, and with that then, we are gonna kick off our presentation. I'm very excited to get started. It is my pleasure to introduce our two presenters today. Ms. Gita Enders, I'm gonna start with Gita. Gita currently holds the position of director in the NYC Health and Hospitals Office of Behavioral Health, where she oversees numerous healthcare delivery system activities and concerns impacts individuals who use mental health, substance use, and co-occurring treatment services. 
and provides oversight to the NYC Health and Hospitals Peer Academy. Prior to joining NYC Health and, Health and Hospitals, Gita provided services ranging from board membership to directing training at peer-run agencies in Arizona. She presents locally and nationally on programming and supervision. Gita is a licensed master's social worker. She has a master's degree in English, with specifically creative writing, a bachelor's degree in psychology, and is a certified psychiatric rehabilitation practitioner, as well as an NYS certified peer specialist. Gita serves as a supervisor to the peer advisory program as a part of the Public Psychiatry Fellowship of Columbia University and the New York State Psychiatric Institute. So happy to have you here today, Gita. It's really an honor. Also thrilled to introduce Ms. Rita Cronice. Rita is an instructional designer with lived experience of a major mental health diagnosis. She is an advanced level RAP facilitator, certified as a peer specialist and peer specialist trainer in the VA and led the development of the SAMHSA-funded Recovery to Practice Advanced Peer Specialist Training. For two years, Rita served as the Acting Director of Operations at the National Association of Peer Supporters, where she coordinated the consensus process among 1,000 working peer specialists across the US that led to 98% agreement on national practice guidelines for the peer workforce. Rita currently holds a faculty position at Rutgers University as the lead instructional designer on the Online Academy of Peer Services, which is the training and testing component of the New York State Peer Specialist Certification. Rita is also the coordinator of the Companion Virtual Community of Practice that served as a bridge between online learning in the Academy of Peer Services and real world practice. Rita continues to serve on a national work group with NAPS on developing guidance for the supervision of peer specialists and other peer support workforce issues. She is a frequent lecturer on peer support values, practice, and supervision. What better people could we have than to be talking about this topic today? So Rita, it's a pleasure to have you. Gita, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and we'll go ahead and we'll pass the floor to you. And thank you, Jennifer, for that wonderful introduction. We really appreciate it. So um, welcome to the webinar. Gita and I will share a little bit about ourselves in just a minute. But first, we'd like to learn a little bit about all of you. We're going to do something called a roll call. Next slide. So Jennifer, if you could launch the poll, what we'd like to do is find out, just describe your role. Are you a peer support worker, a coworker? a supervisor, an administrator, a trainer or technical assistance provider, or a researcher. I'll give you just a minute to enter into the poll. And you can also uh, introduce yourself in the chat by telling, I see some people have done that, by telling us where you're located and something you hope to learn in this session. I think we can take a look at the results. I think people have had a chance to give their input. It looks like we've got quite a few supervisors and quite a few peer support workers and a few other titles. So do you want to tally the poll, Jennifer? I'm going to go ahead and share results. Are you able to see these results here? Um, I'm going to step out for a moment. All right. Can folks see that if I share them this way? I'm not seeing it. Yes, we can. I can see it. Okay, folks can see it okay. All right. I can read it. Looks like we have about 26% peer support worker, coworker at 4%, supervisor 44%, 10% administrator, 10% trainer, technical assistance provider, and then 4% researcher. Terrific. So Gita, did you want to introduce yourself? Are you there? Sure. Sure thing, Rita. Thank you. So my name is Gita Enders, and I'm the Director of Peer Services for NYC Health and Hospitals, which is the public health system for the city of New York. 
Um, <clears throat> Jennifer ran through my credentials, so I will just launch in. I supervise peer support staff as well as non-peer staff, um, and as well as managerial staff who supervise other peer and non-peer staff. So it's a great place to be. Now, before my first major manic episode, I was a computer programmer working in investment banking, which I sometimes think is what put me in the hospital. I walked out with a diagnostic label and a Ziploc baggie with a week's worth of pills. It was wild. Now, this was 25 years ago, and I like to think, uh, and we have certainly here at Health and Hospitals reconsidered uh, treatment protocols. But I couldn't work, and I went to Arizona, because that's what we do, uh, and spent several years at home on their public health system figuring out what was next. But finally, when we worked the myth down to a less stupefying level, I started coming to the clinic where there was what they called a bipolar group. It was amazing. I started feeling better right away. There was a sense of immediacy and visceral realness, if that's a word, that I could feel right through the medication. And I asked the group leader to be my case manager and that's when he told me he was not a clinician, he was a peer support specialist, and then told me something about what that was and about his work. So it was a tremendous thing two years later to be asked to manage a small recovery center and to later become what they call a recovery specialist at the clinic where I received services. Now I'm back in New York doing this, and I can't imagine doing anything else. Rita. Thanks, Gita. So just a little bit about me. I've been involved in, in peer support since 1999, so a little over 20 years now. And prior to that, I had been hospitalized multiple times for psychiatric issues, at one time receiving electroconvulsive therapy or ECT, definitely a lot of heavy doses of medication. In some instances, I was placed in seclusion and restraints. And for me, recovery was what I did to avoid ever going back to the hospital. It wasn't until I started attending depression bipolar support groups, DBSA groups, that I lit and later got involved with the Wellness Recovery Action Plan that I finally understood that recovery wasn't what I did to stay out of the hospital. Recovery was what I did for the whole rest of my life to embrace living my life. I went through a lot of um, support groups and I became support, a support group facilitator, later directed the local chapter of DBSA and caught the attention of our local um, VA hospital. They hired me in to become a VA peer specialist. And I was one of the first 100 peer specialists hired into the VA before they required people who provided peer support services in the VA to have military experience themselves. Um, so I, I did some, some peer support group there, but I wouldn't technically call it peer support because people in the VA have very specialized needs and because I wasn't part of the military establishment. I really, I could be a, a compassionate listener, but I could not really give true peer, what I considered true peer support to the people in the VA, but that comes later. I went on to work very closely with Steve Harrington, who was the founder of the National Association of Peer Specialists. And at one time when he had a life, a career ending stroke, um, I stepped up to the role of acting director for the organization for a brief time. After that, I moved on to become faculty at Rutgers University. And that's where I do the online testing, training and tracking platform for the peer specialist certification in New York. But mostly I wanted to say the peer support changed my life in fundamental ways. And based on what I've experienced myself and seen happen with people throughout the years, I really believe the peer support can save the world. So I work really hard to equip the people that are peers who have a similar calling to be able to do just that. So I'll turn it back over to Gita. And next slide, please, Jennifer. So today's learning objectives uh, are for you to be able to drive mutual support and the core values of peer support, recall and apply the national practice guidelines for peer supporters, compare clinical services with non-clinical peer support, communicate the benefits of supervisors who have lived experience as peer
peer support workers and utilize best practices in the supervision of peer support workers. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Gita, and thanks, Jennifer. So what are we all talking about here? What are the origins of peer support? Well, to me, it's really very simple. Peer support is a natural human response to want to help somebody who's like us. Now, while in this particular session, we're going to be talking mainly about peer support in mental health settings, the underlying thread that ties all of peer support together to me is the common bond. It's knowing that you're not alone. But beyond that, it's the hope that comes from knowing someone else who's been where I am now and has come through it, so maybe I can too. Next slide. So peer support, not only in general, but specific to mental health peer support, has been documented dating back to 1797. Jean-Baptiste Poussin, a former patient, became superintendent of the facility, which were then called asylums, but banned the use of chains and restraints so that more humane treatment could be delivered. Next slide, please. So peer support is based on something called lived experience. and. Lived experience really is what we've learned after reflecting on an experience. Lived experience offers a different kind of knowledge or wisdom than academic knowledge. And peer support can only really be peer support when it comes from a place of knowing. Now, I mentioned that I was hired into the VA and I provided peer support in the VA, but I didn't come from a place of knowing what it was like to be in the military. So, what I did was certainly support and supportive, but I don't truly believe that that was peer support. So when the VA changed their criteria for who could become a peer supporter in the VA, I was a thousand percent in agreement with that, that criteria that you had to have military experience in order to become a VA peer supporter. So having been there and done that, while there are many kinds of help, the most trusted support comes from those who, who know you've been through comes from those who know what you've been through because they've been through it themselves and can speak from that experience. Next slide, please. So before I talk about this, I'd really just like to mention that I highly recommend the work of Thomasina Borgman, who has done extensive research and written foundational articles on the origins and benefits of various kinds of self-help mutual support groups. These are just a couple of definitions that come from a literature review that she recently completed. So self-help is you alone can do it, but you cannot do it alone. And mutual support is the giving and receiving support in the form of lived experience. And we'd like to give all of you now a little bit of a taste of talking about your own lived experience. So give me just a second to see, we've got about a hundred people. So if we could set up 30 breakout rooms, 33 breakout rooms, Jennifer, to get to be prepared to go. What we're gonna do is ask you to join a breakout room to talk a little bit. Next slide, Jennifer. We're gonna ask you in groups of two or three to discuss your own lived experience of mutual support. Now, this is not necessarily about a diagnosis. It's not necessarily about an illness or anything that you've been through, just something that you've, probably had an experience of a time when you were able to help somebody because you had been through something similar or a time when somebody was able to help you because they had been through something similar. So we're gonna go into these breakout rooms for about five minutes. In the breakout rooms, there will be two or three people. So in that five minutes, just talk about one or both of these, these, um, these questions, a time when you were able to help somebody else or a time when somebody else was able to help you because they had been through something similar. Um, we'll time five minutes and watch for a broadcast message in the breakout room to come back to the large, well, actually you'll automatically be brought back to the breakout room or to the large group. So Jennifer, when you, whenever you're ready. So welcome back uh, uh, again. And um, now that you've gotten to know each other a bit, Please briefly post in the chat about a time you were able to help someone using your similar experience or a time that someone helped you because they shared. Oh, it's, it's great. We're starting to get some in. 
So knowing what it's like to wait in the emergency room. Wow. Yeah. As a member of the 12 step community, I often work. Oh, it's going so fast. I can't read it. <laughs> a friend validating my experiences. In my personal life, I've gotten to help other moms navigate early motherhood. Mm. Yeah, that's an amazing one. Thank you. Dual recovery type meetings as a, it's going so fast, I can't read it. <laughs> but thank you for sharing. And this chat is something that I hope we can preserve and maybe share. You know, So as you add to it, as we go on, you can continue to add things that you talked about in that small group, because it just really enriches the, the whole conversation for all of us. So I just wanted to move on a little bit and talk a, a bit about how peer support has evolved within the mental health um, arena. And as peer support grew in mental health, there were two distinct factors that emerged from the early days. And it's helpful in the next part of this conversation just to understand a little bit about the differences. So you often hear about the consumer survivor movement or the consumer survivor ex-patient movement as one of the early influences of peer support. But not everybody really understands the differences between consumers and survivors. So I just wanted to give a, a real quick definition there. So consumers are the people that are still using mental health services or found benefit from mental health services. Consumers are often people that are really eager to partner with the system in order to make improvements. On the other hand, survivors are people that feel that they've survived the mental health system. So consumers are people that may see those challenges, they're willing to partner, but survivors are people who have been so hurt by the system that they wanna prevent the system from hurting anybody else. And they work really hard to create alternatives to the mental health system. Next slide, Jennifer. And just a little bit about the roots of peer support services, peer support really did grow from three very distinct types of mutual support branches. One was the 12 step and 12 traditions that came through Alcoholics Anonymous and all of the many anonymous kinds of groups that grew there. Another came through the patient and family support groups. Like I came, I grew up through the root of the DBSA group or a patient support group. Family support groups like NAMI are also very common. But another really important strand that, that really gives the strength, I think, to the peer support movement is the consumer survivor ex-patient movement. And although peer support is a natural human response to people that are like us, and there are early documented instances of peer support in asylums like in France in the 1970s, the most recognized form of peer support started in the, in the, the form of the Alcoholics Anonymous and then the patient-led support groups which had their own origins back in the 1930s. And again, I'll recommend Thomasina Borkman's writings because she did a lot of extensive research and, and exper experiential research because she actually attended many of these groups and wrote extensively about what it was like to be in these self-help mutual support groups. And that really is in many, in many respects the, the, the origins of, of mental health or the origins of peer support in mental health. The consumer survivor movement had its origins in the 50s and 60s during the time of women's, right and the, the women's rights and civil rights movements. It was really heavily influenced by the women's rights movements and many of the early leaders in the movement had, all, all, had been very involved in the women's rights movement. Women, women's rights movements, I could talk here. And one of the best descriptions of the psychiatric survivor was Judy Chamberlain's book, On Our Own, patient controlled alternatives to the mental health system, where she describes a very oppressive mental health system that was much more harmful than it was helpful to her and to many of the people that she got to know afterwards. Historically, formal mental patients banded together to create alternatives to the system that had hurt so many. So I'm gonna make another heavy recommendation that if you've never read On Our Own by Judy Chamberlain, it's one of the highest recommended readings for greater understanding of the origins of the equality-based anti-oppressive principles that underlie peer support. Next slide, please. And this just talks a little bit from you know, the, the three different branches to more of the evolution. In the 70s and 80s, alternatives to the mental health system were being ex explored and created. And then in the 90s and early 2000s, SAMHSA funded a multi-site research project that named peer support an evidence-based practice. And it came from um, providing services through drop-in centers, mutual support groups, 
peer educator and advocacy programs, <clears throat> multi-service agencies with benefits, counseling and case management, specialized supportive services focusing on crisis respite, employment health and housing, and peer support through um, warm lines. Next slide, please. And another very important factor that has <clears throat> come around, that brought around the, the recognition of peer support was Courtney Harding's research. Courtney Harding and other researchers presented over 30 years of accumulated evidence supporting not only the possibility, but the probability of recovery for people with quote unquote severe mental illnesses. This was foundational to the emphasis on recovery oriented mental health care services. And in Harding's research, over two thirds of the people that she studied did recover and a third recovered fully with no need for medication, no need for quote unquote services. They just went back into the communities and lived their lives. So this was among the first in the scientific literature to challenge the assumption that people with severe mental illnesses never recover. Belief is powerful. Once people believed they could recover, they did. And actually it was happening well before this belief was put out there as the consumer survivor movement demonstrated. So in subsequent years, there's been much discussion about people who become institutionalized, having difficulties recovering from the institutionalization. It's not so much the illness as it's the institutionalization. And in New York, we have peer bridgers who help people make the transition from hospital to community. They often talk about, it's not really hard getting people out of the hospital. What's really hard is getting the hospital out of the people. So the effects of having no voice, no choice, no affirmation that one can be in control of their own life and competent in their everyday lives is really hard to overcome. Next slide, please. So peer support came through all of this as something that grew and thrived in environments where there was a belief in recovery and mutual support. As peers worked with peers, skill was developed through an apprenticeship model where a junior, an apprenticeship model is where a junior practitioner learns their craft from an experienced practitioner. Those who practice peer support, especially those who've been subjected to mental health treatment by experts, are often still vulnerable to that authoritarian control. And organizations that introduce peer support need to understand the importance of believing in the power of recovery and the benefits of mutual support, which doesn't always happen when there's one expert telling somebody else what to do. So we'll talk more about that, but there's a real distinction between organizations that are peer led where mutual support is the core business of the organization and those that practice the, the traditional assessment, diagnosis and treatment where mutual support is neither understood nor practiced by the clinical team. In fact, mutual self-disclosure is often against the code of conduct for many clinical practitioners. In these environments, special attention really needs to be made to ensure the peer support practitioners are be gui being guided in their practice by others who have developed skill and mutual support and strategic self-disclosure. Next slide, please, Jennifer. There's a metaphor that I really love to use, and this comes from the book, First Things First by Stephen Covey, where he talks about the difference between the clock and the compass. And I'm going to quote from the book, First Things First. The clock represents our commitments, appointments, schedules, goals, and activities. It's what we do and how we manage our time. The compass, on the other hand, represents our vision, our values, our principles, our mission, our conscience, and direction. It's what we feel is important and how we lead our lives. The struggle comes when we sense a gap between the clock and the compass and when what we do doesn't contribute to what is most important in our lives. And that gap can be intense. We can't seem to walk our talk. We feel trapped and controlled by other people. And that to me often speaks to what it is that happens with people who are experiencing mental health challenges. To me, peer support represents a way to restore some of that sense of balance back into the lives of people who may have felt they have no control over their own destiny. Those receiving services in the mental health system, 
always seem to be on someone else's clock and following someone else's agenda. The treatments or services are often what an organization has to offer rather than what, pe what people might choose for themselves. For people who receive services, peer support can be like the compass in which a person who is like me, who understands the journey, can help me find my way, perhaps to explore, perhaps to regain a sense of things that are important to me in my own life, and to help me to fight, find out what's important to me in my own recovery. Next slide. So into all of this, it's often people talk about Medicaid billable peer support services. And that is a very important element that's been added in recent years, maybe not so recent, it's been many years now, it's been almost 15 years since Medicaid billable services came about. But in 2007, when Medicaid, when, when peer support was named an evidence-based practice and became a Medicaid reimbursable service, what Medicaid required was state approved training, care coordination, and supervision by a competent mental health professional as defined by the state. And I'll just put in a little plug here because people often want national certification, but each state has the right to define what peer support, what all mental health looks like in the state because every state program is different. So it's really important that the states have the ability to name what peer support is for themselves, I think. And often when we hear about Medicaid billable services, which was introduced when that funding became available in 20, 2007, following that determination, the peer support was evidence-based. Peer support has been, it's important to remember the peer support has been funded since the 1970s and through those demonstration projects in the 80s and 90s. And then it was finally recognized in 2007 by the larger traditional system, which effectively transplanted peer support from the mutual support and mutual supportive environments into traditional settings. And that was taking peer support from its native environment and putting it into a foreign and what sometimes felt very hostile to some people, especially when the place where peer support was being transplanted did not value or understand what peer support brought. So the next slide, please. And this is just a, a picture of kind of this integration that has happened where peer support has been transplanted into traditional settings. And in clinical practice, um, the practice is based on book knowledge and the expertise is gained by formal education and credentials. It's provided in exchange for money. It's unidirectional, meaning it's from an expert to the person rather than a two-way dialogue in most cases. Boundaries are rigidly defined, power is defined in advance, and it's externally regulated based on funders and regulators. And into that comes this non-clinical practice based on lived experience, empowerment, and mutual help, where it's based on experiential knowledge rather than book knowledge. Expertise is defined by that lived experience and is provided in most cases for the love of helping. In true, you know, peer peer support is done for no money. When I was doing the peer support groups through DBSA, there was never a, a money involved. It was all something we did in the community to help each other. But it's being brought into places where there is funding and there is opportunities for people to make a living doing this. Um, unidirectional accountability, meaning that you can go back and forth. Um, there's there's a back and forth with with providing communication and learning that the boundaries are a little bit less rigid and there are complementary roles that are happening. When I was doing support groups, I could be the facilitator one day and it could be just a member of the group another day. And my role would change depending on where I was and what I was doing. Power is situationally defined. You know, who has the most expertise in this moment? Who is the best person to, to work with that person? And in its purest form, it's unregulated. Now, what happens is there's this overlap when peer support is brought into traditional settings where there's the con it's conflicting values, it's conflicting uh, ideas about what's most important in some cases, about who defines what knowledge is the most important in any particular given situation. And that overlap can be a cause of confusion. Next slide, please, Jennifer. 
So all of this was happening um, in 2012 when the, when the National Association of Peer Supporters had their conference in Philadelphia. There were a lot of people that were saying, we need guidance, we need help, we need some way of defining what peer support is for the people that don't understand and some guidelines to follow so that we know what we're doing. So the National Association of Peer Supporters issued practice guidelines for peer support practitioners in 2013. And it was followed by guidance on the role of the supervisor in 2019. And just a little bit for, more for you, those of you that are not familiar with NAPS, the National Association of Peer Supporters is a member organization started by Steve Harrington and a group of peer specialists in Michigan in 2004. And they started with printing a newsletter and then a national conference and then later did research into peer support and then provided a training through the SAMHSA Recovery to Practice Initiative. And through that situational analysis that was done to develop the training on the field of peer support, then we looked at that overlap that was happening between traditional services and peer services and really looked at what it meant to be providing mutual support. Our group convened a task force. We outlined a set of core values that came out of the literature that was in the peer-run organizations. It came out of the trauma-informed literature, and it came out of the World Health Organization on quality rights, you know, rights protection and advocacy. So that was where the core values actually came from. We put it in front of a thousand people. Ninety-eight percent of that thousand people were in full agreement of the core values that we issued back in 2013. And those core values were updated in 2019. And so next slide, Jennifer. If you're not familiar with the practice guidelines, these are the core values. And what I like to call this are kind of the Boy Scout motto version of the core values because there's much more behind the practice guidelines than these. But the core values, again, came from consumer-operated services, trauma-informed peer support, and the World Health Organization. And in a moment, I'm going to ask all of you to, again, join another breakout room. But let me just mention that these core values were developed based on feedback from the field. The actual practice guidelines themselves contain definitions for each of these core values, what these core values look like in practice. And then again, you know, they were updated to provide supervision guide, guidance. So let me just take a quick look at how many people we've got now. Okay, so- Rita, we, we have 102. Pardon me? 102 participants. Thank you. So if we could have 25 rooms, we'll have about five people per room. And what I'm going to ask you to do when we break into the 25 rooms, you'll know, five people per room, is I'm going to post the core values in the chat, which I'll do right now. And you should still be able to see this once you get into your breakout room. So there's the first set. And then the second set. <clears throat> so you all should see now in the in the chat, mutual peer support, mutual, um, peer supporters are hopeful, open-minded, empathetic, respectful agents of change and honest and direct. And then peer support itself is voluntary, which means it supports choice, mutual and reciprocal, equally shared power, strengths focused, transparent and person driven. So as you go into the breakout rooms, and next slide, Jennifer. As you go into the breakout rooms, we're gonna have four to five people per room. So discuss your experience with one or more of the guidelines posted in the chat. You can go around to the five people in the room. We'll have 10 minutes in this breakout. And just say, what guideline do you already do if you're a peer specialist or supervise? If you're a supervisor, what guideline do you already do or supervise well? And then what guideline would you like to do or supervise better? So that's the two questions that we're, we're posing, one that you do well, and one that you'd like to do better. So great, everybody. I hope there were some fruitful discussions. And if now you would share in the chat the things you do, the guidelines you do or supervise well, and the ones you would like to do better. Also, please share any feedback you received from other members in the group. I see that Linnell shared openly. <laughs> Can 
you could just give us any parts of your discussion. Morning in progress. Morning in progress. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was telling the group I started out as a peer, but now as a, a peer supervisor, one thing I was I was letting our breakout session know that it's good to be a peer. Uh, when we when I first started out, me and Sharon that was in my group, uh, peers wasn't called peer support back then. In 2010, we were called peer partners but it was all part of the peer support network. And I was telling my first breakout group, I started out as a client at my organization where I work at the, at the local mental health facility. And peer groups helped me a lot. It helped me uh, deal with my PTSD coming back from the military. And I got offered a position there. So I encourage peer, uh, peer work, peer support so much because as peers, we're mostly open to tell things that psychiatrists, psychologists, LPC can't relate to. And that was one thing when uh, I was going to the VA, uh, instead of always giving me medication, I wanted somebody to say, hey, Linnell, here are the tools that you can use to help you with your PTSD, with your triggers, uh, learning new coping skills, uh, and just somebody telling me it's going to be okay. And I was telling the group, I tell my people all the time, even my peers that work underneath me, I always let them know this is not going to be an easy road. You could take 50 steps forward and get knocked 20 steps back, but that doesn't mean give up. You got to keep moving forward. And Thanks so much, here, Linnell. Thanks so much, Linnell. So we, we need to keep moving, So, but we appreciate the comments and we really appreciate you sharing. Um, and if you could, anyone else wants to share in the chat, we'll continue to look at the chat and we'll um, continue on with the next slide, please. So I mentioned that the core values are sort of like Boy Scout mottos. And so you just had a taste of a really rich and deep conversation around just these bullet points, really, on what those mottos of the core values are about. And time doesn't really allow an in-depth study of the complete National Practice Guidelines document, but I'm going to share this one that gives just a taste of what the core value of peer supporters are hopeful, looks like in practice, and the new supervision guideline that accompanies that practice guideline. So the guideline is peer supporters share hope, tell strategic stories of their personal recovery, in relation to current str struggles faced by those being supported. Peer supporters model recovery behaviors at work and act as ambassadors of recovery in all aspects of their work. Peer supporters help others to reframe life challenges as opportunities for personal growth. So these are what the core values look like in practice according to the guidelines. And there's, there's an extensive grouping of those guidelines. What was happening in the field though was that supervisors didn't understand what the core values were, had no idea really what they would look like in practice. And so what NAPS did in this last iteration of the practice guidelines was to add what is the supervisor's role in helping the peer specialists uphold their own values and their own practice. So in the case of sharing hope, the supervisor's role is to demonstrate confidence in the peer specialist's ability to share a hopeful message, to provide a way to develop, to further develop skills for disclosing personal experience with the goal of inspiring hope, developing trust and support and rapport and fostering strength, and then modeling self-care appropriate boundaries and an authentic belief in recovery through language, attitude, and actions. So again, this is just one example of the more extensive you know, what the guidelines look like. And we offer more extensive training on this and moving from motto to demo that includes these supervision tips. And now as we're talking about supervision, with that, I'd like to turn this next segment over to Gita. Thank you. Thank next you, slide, So um, we talked a little bit about the clinical model and the peer uh, model and, um, 
So clinical supervision is usually about educating a junior member of a profession to meet competency standards in that practice. Uh, it is part of a developmental model and supervision from a licensed mental health professional with a Medicaid directive. Uh, peer supervision, uh, core values are mutual, excuse me, mutuality and self-help. Um, as Rita mentioned, we employ an apprenticeship model. It is rooted in developmental model because the first literature on peer support supervision was drawn from social work supervision, psychology supervision, although it's advanced substantially since then. And the five critical functions of supervision model provides a framework that highlights some of the nuances <clears throat> that address the unique concerns of peer support workers. Now, the five critical functions of supervision model was developed by Dr. Jonathan Edwards of the New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Columbia University. It is presently the subject of research out of Rutgers University <clears throat> in which supervision competency statements are drawn from focus groups and surveys of a panel of experts. This is called the Delphi model. And in this case, peer support workers and peer support workers supervisors are our panel of experts series of surveys is presently taking place, and the five functions are administrate, support, educate, advocate, and evaluate. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to walk you through this slide. It's a little lengthy, but <clears throat> it presents the five critical functions as a matrix of tasks that the supervisor must perform to ensure that peer support work is understood, valued, and appropriately included. This list is by no means exhaustive. Under administrate, you'll find things like hiring and orienting staff who meet the job qualifications and assisting them with understanding practices, policies, and procedures. By support, we are referring to the building of rapport through constructive feedback, the promotion and modeling of wellness and self-care and utilization of strength-based and trauma-informed approaches. When providing support, it may be tempting to treat the worker like a client or a recipient, but you always have to remember you're not their friend. When educating, we explain the big picture and offer the context and value of the peer role as it supports the mission. Coach staff and engagement and education methods and offer training and conference attendance opportunities. You know, fallout from the pandemic is that it's easier to get time off for a virtual conference with little or no travel and lodging or other out-of-pocket expenses. So it's uh, Jennifer and we were talking about some of the um, positive <laughs> things that came out of these electronic meetings. And I see we have some more from Canada, so right away, <laughs> that's really excellent. Um, in our roles as advocates, we safeguard the work environment continue to promote the value of peer support, and we advocate on individual team, program, and community levels, so macro, meso, and micro levels. Um, the discussion of the power differential is inherent in the need to evaluate, but a good evaluation process includes managing expectations with regard to job performance, conducting the actual evaluation, and addressing areas of improvement up to and including progressive discipline when warranted. He is ensuring that what is being evaluated aligns with peer values. Um, next slide, please. So back to the clock and the compass, I think the biggest challenge faced by peer support workers is a lack of alignment between peer values and the treatment orientation. So as Rita mentioned, the question often arises, are we on the clock with treatment as usual or the compass helping people navigate their individual recovery journey? Next slide, please. So here are some myths that pose further barriers to the inclusion of peer support workers that come to us from Larry Davidson and Steve Harrington. Uh, are peer staff too fragile to handle the stress of the job? Well, we do not diagnose peer supporters. Rather, we determine if the worker is able to perform essential functions. 
Then there's the question of relapse. And I suppose sometimes that happens, as it does with many non-peer staff. Um, we have doctors relapsing, uh, housekeeping staff relapsing. Uh, this is not something that uh, happens limited to peers. And since peers are often uh, self-regulating and in treatment, sometimes that happens less. Um, all employees, including peers, will take off time to do the illness, which includes mental health issues. And again, I think we see this clearly in this time of the pandemic. Can peer staff handle administrative work? Good supervision and skills training can support peer staff in managing those tasks. And let's not forget that many peer support workers have done all kinds of work prior to their calling as peers and may excel at an administrative task. Peer staff break confidentiality. They will probably be even more sensitive to issues given their own lived experience and how that was handled by the systems that they were involved in. And lastly, won't peer staff make my job harder? Not only is the perspective of the peer important and useful, but their enrichment of participants' lives allows other staff to concentrate on their own, often clinical, roles. Um, next slide. So also from Larry Davidson and Steve Harrington, some situations that can arise and what to do about them. So supervision should be structured with formal guidelines and an agenda. I do group supervision weekly and individual supervision usually one per month, depending on how many peers are working in our system. It should be used to clarify tasks and expectations. Supportive supervision or therapy. These boundaries need to be established at the outset and redirect or identify appropriate support when the temptation arises. Understanding and respecting the role of the peer. Keep the discussion of the value of peer support alive, both with the peer supporters and with the organization. As always, clarify expectations. Resolving interpersonal conflicts involves listening to all sides of the story and facilitates mutual respect and resolution. Back to those performance evaluations, you can document, keep a journal. I run a paperless office. You can do it in a Word document. I also uh, provide people with a supervision note that they read an initial, although we do co-create the supervision note, providing feedback and support, and implement progressive discipline when necessary. Next slide, please. So some ways to overcome naturally forming barriers. So set the stage for inclusion of peers by educating non-peer staff on the role and value of peer support. Provide a clear job description both to human resources and to new peer support workers. Supervision should focus on job performance and job support with good boundaries. Never make assumptions about mental health or substance careful to avoid offering therapy for those issues. Many supervisors with peer support workers are mental health or addiction counselors or social workers who have to be very careful uh, to avoid diagnosing. The nature of peer work will inevitably cause secondary and sometimes even primary trauma. So take an empathetic trauma-informed approach and again, direct staff to appropriate resources and support. And always advocate for more than one peer so as to avoid isolating people in a one-person community of practice. Next slide, please. So I used to do this as um, what peers need, and really, all staff need the same thing. All staff need definition and maintenance of their role identity. They'll want to especially avoid peer drift into clinical or administrative tasks that are not a part of the job or that clinicians are overwhelmed with. Uh, on that note, specific job functions 
for, I know that no one here who's handy with computers wants to become the office IT guy. Um, that slips into a lot of people's job descriptions. Maintain boundaries. You would never ask a subordinate staff to fix your car or type your master's thesis. Make feedback constructive. I like to use something that I understand has gone out of favor, but I like it anyway, which is the praise, polish, praise sandwich. First you speak to a strength, then a little bit about what needs improvement. Finish off with a strong statement of acknowledging of the good work being done. Personal and professional development. No one wants to be stuck in a dead-end job. Ensure that peer support is not that, has growth. And lastly, everyone needs good supervision. I know I have to sometimes send a little email that I needed supervision. Um, next slide, please. So again, a good supervision prepares the way explains the peer role, make sure that the peers understand the mission, vision, and value of the program or agency, promote development, and be free with tools, skills, knowledge, handouts, whatever is in your arsenal as a supervisor. And hopefully, as Rita alluded to, hopefully a supervisor that's also done peer support has a toolbox that's ready to go. Um, next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about what we do at New York City Health and Hospitals because um, uh, over the 10 years I've been here, almost 10, I am pleased to say that as difficult as it is with our vulnerable populations, many of whom are homeless and um, so come in frequently into our emergency departments and into our inpatient psychiatric units. Um, we've been working with peer support workers since the late 90s. Right now, we have about 85 peer support workers across the system with another 35 openings and more every day. In fact, we are just embarking on a peer support worker training program as there's tremendous demand in the New York City metropolitan area for trained peers. In our agency, peers are union members, which provides for regular salary negotiation as well as job protection, health, and other benefits. One result of collective bargaining is that we have some of the highest salaries for peers in the country, plus benefits that can equal 60% or more of salary. More and more of our peer support workers are supervised people with the lived experience of providing peer support. We're very much into um, very much, well, you'll see our career path has three levels of the title leading to supervisory and finally managerial roles. Next slide, please. So Dr. Edwards, who I mentioned earlier, and I, I think, I feel like it was in 2017, which is, we'll have to take a look at updating this. So the top 10 David Letterman things summarized. Prepare the organization. Make physical room for the new employee, equipped with what they need for the job, whether it's a computer or brochures or whatever they want, a place to put their coat. Um, they don't need their own office, but it, it's nice if you have one. Um, treat the peer support worker like any other staff. They are not a client. Now, I'm not saying do not provide accommodations. But I am saying if if the peer worker disappears for a week, you have to treat them as anyone else uh, who disappears. If um, everyone else gets a lunchbox, they just brought one in here for me. <laughs> um, but they are not a client. Provide that clear job description. Provide scheduled, regular, and consistent supervision. That's the first slide. Next slide, please. Supervision is not therapy as much as we like to help out. Uh, focus on job performance, not the illness. Solicit and be open to feedback. Model mutuality. Uh, don't be afraid to make appropriate referrals to human resources if you're in that kind of agency. Uh, here at 
H and H. We go to HR for reasonable accommodations or equal employment opportunity concerns because that's considered confidential information between the employee and the um, and the HR department. And uh, the, they might come back and ask, does this reasonable accommodation impair your work to the degree that we can't do it? Very rarely is that the case. And finally, promote professional development. Peers are not defined by their illness or their substance use. They, in fact, our union uh, offers free tuition up to the bachelor's level, and that's how we're moving some people into management. Next slide, please. So now we have told you what we're going to say, then said it, then told you what we said. So thanks so much for your time. Uh, are there any questions or comments? You can share that in the chat or unmute and um, tell us what you think. Do you, I have a question. Um, I'm Stacy Walsh, a program manager for the Disaster Distress Helplines online peer support communities. Um, and because we have per diem workers that uh, obviously have other, other, we have like many, many per diem work uh, peer supporters um, who have other positions. It is really hard to do individual supervision. We just don't have the capacity for that. So we have to do group supervision. And I do find that it is really a challenge to do consistent um, group supervision, making sure that everyone attends, that we're all looking at. We have a, a number of best practices that we have to follow. And so we have to make sure that we're looking at scenarios for interactions and, um, you know, really like helping them increase and enhance their skills and peer support. Um, are there any like tips that you can offer about group supervision that, um, continues to like enhance their skills? Well, for me, in our group supervision, we, um, for, we have an agenda. Um, and first we cover housekeeping and then we um, cover case presentation, what people have done with their time. And I, I'm sorry, what was the last thing you said? Because that's what I wanted to respond to. I think it's like wanting to know if you have any tips for like um, how to like maximize group supervision uh, because well, we're looking specifically at their interactions, their scenarios with, cause we, you know, this is online and using it as a way to have discussions about how they can improve their skills. Well, what I always do for that I shouldn't say always because I like to mix it up, but what I typically do when we're talking about skills training, um, we'll have a little presentation, you know, five, ten minutes about what the skill and what people think that skill is. And then we will, um, if it's a large group, I've had groups up to 11 or 12. I don't like bigger groups than that if possible. Um, although I've had all 85 peers, but not for supervision, just for community of practice but is to have two people or a small group of people who are good at this do a role play or a demonstration. And then I like, this is a very social work thing, and then I like to break people up into pairs or small groups to practice the skill and then bring them back together and report out uh, from their group. And then of course, questions. Thank you, that's really helpful. Like I'd like to put in a plug too for the for the guidelines because one of the things that we've done in a group supervision kind of setting, especially in trying to keep peer values peer, is to take one of the 12 core values a month and make that the focus of the month. And it's not a short conversation, but it can be what, it's very much like what we had you do here is what's one thing that I'm doing well, what's one thing that I need more help with. And for the things that people need help with, actually role-playing it. You know, or bringing in ideas from each other because it's the sharing of information that makes group supervision so powerful. Okay, that's so helpful. Thank you. Uh, Gita and Rita, there's questions in the chat. One is about risk aversion. 
the other question, if we can get to it, actually speaks to uh, helping peers, in quotations, stay in their lane, uh, which I think may be a role clarity question. You know, I want to, yeah, I see that question from James. I saw that and I was thinking about it in the background. So this is um, a twofold issue. We're very lucky at H and H. Everyone is in a union, and everyone can grieve somebody if they're doing if there's spillage. So if a peer is trying to do social work, the social work can get a union rep and say you're working out of title and you have to stop doing that. Um, a more friendly way of doing this is to bring the conversation back to the skill they're trying to use. What bring the conversation back to the peer values. How is what you're doing reflecting the peer values? And get people to prompt themselves and to um, stay in their, in their lane. I, I mean, I hate that expression, but it is an, an issue because a lot of times uh, peer support workers want to help and they want to add that, that little bit of social work or mental health counseling or addiction counseling. But, um, so we help them by coming back to the values and practice guidelines. I was just responding in the chat, so I lost track of what we were talking about. I, I was curious about risk aversion because I wasn't quite sure I understood what that means. Uh, I, I posted that question, Rita Stan Rosowski here. Hi, Stan, it's good to see you. Thank you. It's always a joy to be with you folks down there. I'm in Winnipeg in Canada, so far away from everything. And, and um, anyways, what I've run into uh, frequently working in community services here is that there's policies and, and protocols in place wherever I go. And there's steps, you know, where as a peer, I feel I'm not taking a risk or I am aware of a risk and am confident that uh, uh, I can manage it, but policies, you know, I've had, um, you know, spent hours creating a relationship with an individual and uh, actually got him to come back the next day. I didn't ask him for a contract or anything when he left because, you know, that's just a piece of paper. I knew it, but I got his word. He was going to come back and see me. Uh, then other people got involved. They made him sign a contract and, and then when he came back the next day, the police were, uh, they called the police and had him arrested. And, so, uh, so that's the kind of situations that I, I run into periodically. Uh, I, yes. I'm prepared to take different risks uh, than an agency will. Yeah, and that could be the topic of 10 webinars, actually, because there's so much to that, Stan, and I appreciate you raising it. Um, Peer support is different. Peer support is human to human. It's bringing yeah. the humanity back to, to what can often be seem like dehumanized services. And what I just really believe that when we look at what really is the risk to being human, you know, that was my, my response to that. And I know our time is, is running out. And I just really want to honor your question and say, let's let's look at that together, maybe in some future webinars. That'll be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So, Jennifer, why don't you go ahead and go to the next slide? We're going to be able, you are going to be providing these um, slides to everybody. And one thing I wanted to be sure you all know is the contact information for the National Association of Peer Supporters. A few of you have asked about supervision um, resources. They have a whole web page that's devoted to supervision. It's a repository of supervision resources that we put into the repository as we were looking at the at revising the practice guidelines to include supervision. So there's quite a lot in there. Um, and it's due for an update. So if any of you know of good resources to share with us, we're happy to try to add that and keep that repository going. But I just really want to encourage you, if you're not already a member of NAPS, of the National Association of Peer Supporters, to think about that. This is Gita and I contact information. Next slide. Just to see what's here. These are the references. So I mentioned Thomasina Borkman. I mentioned Judy Chamberlain. I mentioned Jean Campbell. I mentioned um, Courtney Harding. All of those are in this resource section. So you'll be able to look some of that information up. There's a next page to this. Truly, truly appreciate you all. 
Thank you so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful day today. All right, take good care.